Hi. Um, so uh, my name is Julia Hynaxius. Welcome to the spring 2019 art lecture series. Uh, we apologize for the technical difficulties. This has set us, uh, so it's a little bit after noon at this point, um, which means that um, because we want to um, listen to um, as much as Dave Kennedy is uh, willing to talk about um, the work today, we're uh, going to have a very limited, if um, at all, a public question and answer conversation at the end. Um, typically during the art lecture series, we'll have uh, some Q and A at the end. But um, at this point, uh, we really just want to uh, listen to uh, Dave Kennedy. So um, brief thanks to uh, the Evergreen State College uh, deans and administration for supporting this series. Uh, Shah Osha, Julia Zay, who have been running this series um, this year and in past years. Uh, Julie Ron for helping us with, out, uh, with all the paperwork. Um, media services and the media interns, um, this uh, type of work, um, this uh, complex um, series of tubes um, would not be figured out without uh, their help. Uh, and uh, I also want to just point out that there's multiple different interdisciplinary programs that are visiting uh, the Artist Lecture Series today. We won't have time to name them all, but in future um, gatherings, we will. Um, I especially want to thank Dave Kennedy for the flexibility and precision with which he is um, dealing with the fact that not all of the work is going to be shown exactly the way um, it would have been had the sound wor uh, be working today. Um, but I'm still incredibly excited uh, to see the work that Dave is going to share with us today. Um, and. Uh, without further ado, would like to invite up uh, Madison Moser, a student in the Image Object Illusion um, program, to uh, give a little bit of a formal introduction. Thank you. Hello. Dave Kennedy received an MFA in Interdisciplinary Arts from the University of Washington and an undergraduate degree in Visual Communication from Western Washington University. Only a fraction of the numerous fellowships, grants, and residencies Kennedy has received are the Four Culture Individual Project Award, Centrum Engineering Artist Residency, Artist Trust Grant for Artist Projects, the Joanne Bailey Wilson Endowed Scholarship, and the Yaddo Artist Residency and Fellowship. Kennedy has presented on topics of marginaliz marginalization and objectification to audiences of the Society of Photographic Educators, Cornish College of, excuse me, Cornish College of the Arts and the University of Washington. His amazing multimedia works have been exhibited in both solo and group shows in Seattle, Portland, Denver, Chicago, New York, and many more locations stretching even to Spain. Currently an adjunct, adjunct professor, excuse me, at Photo Center Northwest, Kennedy maintains a full-time studio practice in Seattle and is represented by Bridge Productions. As a student of visual arts, Dave Kennedy's work excites me because of the way its ideas, excuse me, it has conversations between uh, material, appearance, um, medium, and display. Two of his series, The Likeliness of an Appearance and A Stranger Stands Here, particularly stand out to me because of the way um, the pieces both work to capture and represent an object or material through an alternative medium, then directly expose its illusion to the next, in the next piece over. I'm looking forward to learning more about Kennedy's process, inspiration, and narratives behind his captivating work. Please join me in warmly welcoming Dave Kennedy. Um, thank you so much, and thank you for that amazing introduction. I really appreciate that. Um, okay, so I wanted to just start out by saying that when I thought about coming to do a lecture here, um, the I thought about being in education as an educator and also as a student coming to see a lecture like this. And um, I was just thinking that it would be really 
nice, hopefully for you all, if I went through the history of my work. Uh, I wanted to just briefly take you through the process in which, well, not necessarily where I began because we'd have to go all the way back to maybe this guy. Um, <laughs> but he's important because uh, as we get into the later, as we get into the later history of my work and get closer to today, uh, this guy comes up a lot. So with that said, I'm going to walk you through the history of my work. And I'm going to actually try to do it somewhat quickly. So if it feels like I'm rapidly going through this, it's because I want to give you a little bit of time to ask questions if that's something you want to do. Okay. With that said, so this is an image from one of my earliest projects. And it's something that I worked on in around two, from around 2006 to 2008. And it's a series that I now call photographic translations. Some of these images, some of the images that I'll show you from this series have been on display at Seattle Art Museum's gallery and other places in Seattle and elsewhere. The whole series, the body of work, was my attempt to photograph staged psychological dramas. So to develop these themes, I created a journal of writings. And these writings were inspired by readings, conversations that were all centered around dreams. These were dreams that were experienced by me, as well as by my friends and people that uh, saw some of the early images and wanted to talk about the dreams. And I just basically tried to recreate stills from those dreams. And through this process, it gave me a deeper understanding of people's universal thoughts, imagery, and their emotions. Okay. So while I was recording these thoughts and dreams through imagery, themes of passion, self-doubt, inner struggle, introspection all found their way through the, the developing visions. But I also was starting to think about the multicultural worlds of religion, politics, health, and family. So I started thinking about this idea of duality within a person and how one might be experiencing several things at the same time. And we'll come back to that later. But as I started making these images, I started looking at other people's work. And I was really drawn to Greg Crudson's work and I loved his, the reason I was drawn to is I loved his staging, his lighting, this, I, this the, um, the precision to which he put together these images that are, to me, are both beautiful and ugly at the same time. Again, this idea of having multiple feelings that happen at the same time was starting to become important to me. So often Crudson displays, um, takes pictures of what he calls small town America, and his work is often described as being very cinematic. And as I was looking at his work, I noticed that his work um, portrayed a sense of psychological anxiety, a bit of fear and some desire, and they were all within this kind of cinematic framework. And it was this framework and the suggestion of symbols and icons that was of great interest to me. And, um, and it continues to become really important to my, to my body of work. So coming back to my work, 
along with this idea of being inspired by staging and lighting and conveying personal stories and visions, there was this I idea that I mentioned earlier of wanting to play with this display of an expanse of an emotion. I was kind of getting tired of um, photography in the sense that we would only show one angle of view of someone. Um, I wanted to point to something larger that was going on. I wanted to ask the question with my work, well, what happens when we look longer? What happens when we show more layers? And is it possible to see despair, determination, and consideration all at once? And I, most of all, I wanted these uh, photographs to have an imaginary possibility that could hang over them. Uh, a, an isolated moment that would have no past and no future. Just a present single moment in time that the viewer could imagine what happened before and what happened afterwards. So I've always been interested in this idea of constructing a photograph and it's, it's what initiated my work in general. But as I started to do this type of work, I started to think about creating my own world and what that meant to me. And I wanted to, what was becoming important to me was this idea of establishing our world and pointing to it. And I didn't really quite know at this point in time that what that meant was establishing a world that pointed out my experiences. So we'll get to that in a few moments too. <laughs> so I started looking at this idea th through other photographers' work. Again, um, a lot of what I like to do as an artist is research what else is out there, what's come before me, what's happening now, what I see artists doing in their studio as a way to help inform um, me of the language that is being used to communicate um, an idea. So I started looking at Anthony Goykla's work, and he, um, at the time making this work, is a 30-something-year-old artist using elements of self-portraiture self to explore the awkward journey into adulthood. And as you can see through these photographs, he is repeating a character or several same looking characters over and over again to bring a certain emphasis to his narratives. And so this idea of using staging and technology became more and more of great interest to me. So I continue to consider this idea of same characters within my own work. I shot this image back in around 2008, 2009, and just continued to explore this idea of speaking to the mental, emotional stages of being a human with all of our parts rather than just focusing on photography's having been there aspect. And I also considered my own days of being a disenfranchised, disengaged, and somewhat defiant youth. It's true. <laughs> but I won't go into it today. So around this time, Gary Fagan of NPR fame had a look at my work. And he described this uh, style of photography as drawing from painting and religious symbolism. And having never met me, he said, with a name like Kennedy, that I must be a white Irish guy that hasn't been able to let go of my Catholic upbringings. <laughs> None of this is true. <laughs> However, uh, during this 
review, he also mentioned Jeff Wall as a reference when speaking about stage narratives. So, of course, I had a lot of questions. And being a researcher, um, or the type of artist that likes to use research to get to the bottom of things, I researched the top, I researched Jeff Wall, I researched this idea of being artists and using religion and history and painting um, as um, a way to inspire your own work. And because of the question about my name, I started to think about myself and who I am within the context of my given name, within the context of being a person who has skin darker than others, um, and started to really ask myself questions about what does that all mean? But in that process, I kind of started looking at Jeff Wall's work and started thinking about the way that he stages some of his photographs and the way that he uses photography as a recording device to identify people. Who we are, how we interact with each other, how we interact with the world, I found all of that really interesting. And I wanted to start pulling some of that into my own work. And I also found this idea of small gestures within an image to be of interest. And all these things are what really fascinated me about Jeff's, Jeff Wall's work. Um, there is a significant peep work that he did which is called A Picture for Women. And it is his comment on, on a painting through a recreation, his recreation of it um, through a photograph. So we've got the picture on your right and then his, his recreation on the left. And I'll just briefly say that in this painting, um, Manet, the name of the painting is A Bar at the Follies. In this painting, Manet is a very, very old school painter and what he was trying to do was, a lot of things were written about this image and I think that what was said was that he was putting females on display along with all the other items on the counter. Um, and Jeff Wall, trying to be a more conscious um, artist, was like, well, I don't really want to do that. I don't, wanna, I don't want this to be a part of the artist's gaze. So he stepped away from being behind his camera to subvert this idea of uh, the artist gazing longingly at the female and tried to put himself on somewhat equal or lesser ground than the female up front. I think he did an okay job with that, but there's more to be said about that maybe in another lecture. But this idea, the main thing I wanted to point to was this idea of using painting as a way to inspire other work. And so I started thinking about that and I started thinking, looking at artists like Caravaggio and I started out wanting to make my own depictions of paintings and I also wanted to make them point to this idea of what would it be like if we had modern day apostles? Where would they be? Uh, Caravaggio was contracted to make these paintings by the church and I was like, well, what would happen if I was asked to do this? What would they be? Would they be, would they all be white guys in robes? Would they, would they be people of different ethnicities? Would they be, what would they be dressed like? And I decided that, um, that I would have them all be on a, on a bus and they, and they would be um, the people um, who were standing in for these uh, apostles would then be, um, look like maybe Capitol Hill hipsters. So 
I started researching what it was like to be on a bus. I grew up taking the bus, and I started taking a bunch of pictures of areas on the bus. And from completion, from from beginning, from the beginning of research to completion, the images that I'm going to show you from the series took over two years to um, finish, and they were all. Um, it started out with test shots, like I said, on the bus. Eventually, I drove a bus into a large hangar so that I could control the light and have models in and out of that bus. Um, and I'll show you a couple pictures from that as well. So this is Thomas the Apostle. This is St. Peter. And again, I'm working with this idea of multiples. I'm, I'm thinking about this idea about representing or pointing to paintings as an inspiration and thinking about religion, which none of this would have came about if it wasn't for that, that um, review by Gary Fagan. Um, so, Process-wise, I would literally sit on the bus and draw these scenes to scale before I ever photographed them. Because I, being a poor, cheap artist, um, I knew that I wasn't going to have a lot of time with the bus because I had to rent it. And I wasn't going to have a lot of time with the hangar because I was going to rent that too. And so I was going to have to move people in and out of the bus and take these photographs very quickly, and so everything had to be planned in advance. So to, so to come up with these images, I literally read a bunch of texts. I read the Bible, which I never did before, um, and studied painted depictions of apostles from the 15th through the 17th century. Simon's, that's Simon the Zealot. So, for instance, we have Caravaggio's Betrayal of Jesus. And this is my version of Judas the Iscariot. So, again, as you can see as we go through my work, that I'm continually thinking about, like, how can I make a photograph be something more than just your stereotypical photograph? And I'm just trying out different things. So this is Matthew the Evangelist. This is a, a production still of the bus inside of the hangar. I made these huge flags so that I could control the light that was coming into the hangar. And I had a bunch of people working with me. So I worked with the crew, um, actually we'll go back here. I worked with this a crew of models, makeup artists, uh, eventually an animal trainer. I had this hawk inside of the bus flying down the aisleway so I could make this image. Um, that is, uh, so as a nod to each of the painted depictions for the series, each of the apostles is featured with symbols referencing their martyrdom, patronage, and the stories attributed to them. So to create these composites, I'm basically having the, the model or actor sit in these various positions interacting with somebody else, and then I'm just basically taking out the somebody else so that it eventually looks like they're interacting with themselves. And this is um, St. John the Apostle. It's played by a female. And um, this is based on the Gospel of John, which contains references to him, John, um, as the disciple whom Jesus loved. And so it's generally believed that John was actually a female. All right, moving on. This is another production still. Sometimes I had to, like, get on a ladder and shoot through 
a uh, window I detach in the bus to make images that look like that. And so one of the things I'll tell you before we take another turn, that each one of these images to composite together would take close to 50 hours in Photoshop. And it drove me crazy. So, so much so that I decided that I was never gonna make these composites ever again. And I got so tired that I decided to create a different series, one to where I could, that I could shoot in my living room that didn't rely on anybody else except for me. Um, and I could be in my bathrobe taking these photographs because I don't want to have to worry about working with a ton of people, driving a bus to a hangar, being in front of my computer for 50 hours. I needed a break. So I created this series also to give me an opportunity to take up smokings, <laughs> which I don't do anymore. But I came, this series is called Gaspers, Dugans, Jackson Cools. And it's a series of macro observations of cigarettes that I refer to as portraits. Again, there's this idea of rethinking how we see people. What is a portrait? And as I came up with this series, started shooting, and everybody kept saying, well, well, hey, man, have you checked out Irving Penn's cigarettes? It's like, no, but now I will. <laughs> so I did. And I thought they were kind of cool. But me being biased, I like mine better. <laughs> so again, these are what I call macro observations of impressions created by people. They're sculptures made by people through the act of smoking. They become a representation of the person who smoked it, so therefore I call them a portrait. And the idea was to, the, th the thinking behind that was to free the subject matter, uh, the idea of portraits from its literal interpretation of what we imagine portraits to be, and recontextualizing cigarettes um, as those portraits. Here's a grid of a bunch of them. So I'm, I'm thinking about things, and I'm thinking about this idea of how we represent somebody, how can we see um, someone, and asking the question of what constitutes the representation of a person. In the same way that Edward Weston imagined how we might be able to see a red bell pepper or a green onion. So I started looking at Edward Weston's still lives and they brought me back to Irving Penn's still lives which inspired me to make my own still lives. And this is when things really kind of started to take a turn for me. Because I started really thinking about representing my own experience. And I, as a person who is black, but also Native American, and also Italian, who lives in Seattle, who's also from Tacoma, who makes art, but also likes to bake, I consider myself someone who might just be, might just live outside of this non-binary world. And I considered representing that in some way, and the way that I came up with it was to make these strange combinations um, as a way to talk about my own ethnicity and experiences. So this series of images where I took meat and fruit and fruit and fruit combinations and made these still life, still working in the living room in my bathrobe. Um, I, I call them amalgams. So 
I, the reason I did this was to point towards appearances in an effort to um, encourage the conversation about looking beneath the skin of things. And I, I started to do this as a way, get it, eggplant, eggplant? Okay. All right, anyway, sorry. Uh, this is my only, only dad joke of the <laughs> artist lecture. Um, so to do this, I, I started to kind of think about this, I, this potential for uh, an experience of an object. How do we experience an object? All right. So, now we're getting closer to today. Presently, my photographs, installation, video work is drawn by my own experience. The experience that I mentioned to you, this idea, this reality of being mixed race, having multiple experiences, also being raised in the Pacific Northwest in an old World War II housing project. And I'm so happy that I have a, one picture from this area because it um, no longer exists. This space that I grew up in was under constant construction. It literally looked like this most of the time. That construction never got finished. Like I said, they eventually ripped the whole neighborhood down. Maybe there's some people who are from Tacoma who know Salishan. Shout out to any of you people who are from Shacktown because it looks diff way different than it used to. Um, but during that time, many people of different ethnicities lived in my neighborhood. On each street block, there could be somebody who was from some part of Asia. There could be somebody who was black. There was somebody who was white and from Indiana. There were people from everywhere on one street block. It wasn't until I moved away from that neighborhood when I was in my late teens that I didn't real, really realize that the rest of the world was a little bit more segregated than that. Um, but along with that, came a lot of racism and bigotry at that time. Me being a dark-skinned young boy, remember the kid that I showed you earlier with curly dark hair that wasn't quite an afro, no one could quite place me and it was quite common for people to ask me, what are you? And over time, this objectifying question um, became more and more embedded into my practice and exploration into this pursuit of an expanded view of unseen subjectivities. So I was thinking about my photographs and I was thinking about all these spaces that I was drawn to to take these images where I'm showing an expanse of an emotion and thinking about and realizing a little bit slowly that I was taking pictures of spaces that reminded me of where I grew up. Um, taking photographs of spaces that um, reminded me of all the places that I would play in. And what I was realizing is that I was going to these spaces, back to them, and reinventing or inventing and reimagining how to see. Um, so again, I started looking at other artists who connected these sensibilities, such as Antonio Tapis, and also looked at Gordon Mata Clark, who saw urban spaces in a whole different light. And started looking at David Hockney's work and how he kind of looked at a photograph a little bit differently. So again, I'm just kind of looking um, at different ways to subvert what we normally, how we normally see an image or a photograph. 
So I realized that growing up in these places of various states of repair and ruin provided me with this playground when I was a kid to escape that bias and bigotry. And now I return to these spaces. I look for these spaces and try to return to these memories attempting to reveal the marvelous that is often hidden in these less regarded spaces. And these less regarded spaces stands as a metaphor for how I felt. So I extended the availability to other, to alternative roles, uh, of, of alternate roles to these subjects, places, and objects that, I'm find, that I've been finding. So I'm turning spaces that look like that into installations that look like this. And what I'm doing is I'm just basically going out and mapping these spaces with my camera. I'm taking hundreds and hundreds of detailed photographs. I finally left the living room. <laughs> and I'm printing these sections out on copy paper and then stitching them back together. So construction sites, dilapidated houses, abandoned parking lots are all familiar spaces of refuge for me. And I collect these objects within these spaces I find and layer them back on top of the pieces that I create. So as you can see, it's hard to tell unless you saw these in real life, but there's actual physical objects on top of these collages. And then I repeat those items. So things like this fence stick that's laying on top of that fence is repeated next to it as a flat print where you can see all the different sides of that stick. Here's a, another image of it. And then it appears later in another part of the installation. But these are made out of photocopies. They're not the real thing. They're hollow veneers. So I consider the action of deconstructing with my camera and then adhering the tiled photocopy sections back together as a performance. People don't really ever get to see the performance, but I'm out there performing an act, performing a ritual, performing, reenacting my experience with space and revisiting my experiences with racism and bigotry. Um, and I do this performance, this act of taking these things apart and putting them back together again because I think that social constructs are also are stories that can also be taken apart and told differently. So I work on the floor and I move these tiled sections around, layering in objects uh, such as this green tube that I'm holding. And sometimes I take hundreds and hundreds of photographs, inching my way around that same tube so that you can see it on display elsewhere within the installation and you can see all the sides of it at once. And this is uh, an installation view of a uh, view to a passageway, which has some of my sculptures that are made out of paper, flattened views, as well as a collage. This is an old abandoned grocery store. I think it was a QFC. This was actually shot in Seattle. And I collected things like the pegboard and, the, and that stir stick that is on your left. And then those things then get recreated out of photocopies and exist elsewhere within the space. That, that stir stick, which is only about maybe three feet long, ends up be coming made being made out of paper and then made to about eight feet long so that it looks like it could be a painted two by four. And the piece next to it is made out of over 150 pieces of copy paper, so it's about 15 feet long. So this is a piece that I call Black Raspberry Supreme, um, and it's completely made out of photocopies. This is a detailed view of it. And this is an installation view of a couple of them. So I'm going to the space and I'm noticing details. And the details that I notice are 
representations of my own reality. The reality that I mentioned before, this idea of representing both what they are and something else all at the same time. Maybe you all have that same experience too. So, such symbols like this scrap, wood scrap, with the painted white stripe on it, I hope allow for a different way of seeing the self. Here's the same wood scrap as it appears as a flattened version of itself. And that same wood scrap is on the collage, about in the center right up from that parking stripe. It's also on the ground next to it, underneath the collage. What happens when we see an image over and over and over again from different angles? Does it start to break down what our initial assumptions were about it? So both these pieces, again, are constructed out of photocopies. They're hollow veneers. They're both an image, an object, a photograph, a sculpture. They give you the opportunity for you to bring something of your own to it. They can hold all those things at once but yet they're just hollow veneers. There's nothing inside of them. Uh, just for reference, this piece is about 13 inches wide. Yes, the nails are made out of paper too. Um, so, I'm taking junk. Um, and using it as a form of represent, representing my own experience. Um, so not only am I calling identity into a question, I'm also subverting the idea of what is a con conventional aesthetic. And I'm asking a question about what is the relative value of objects in our society. And just to be clear, I'm not talking about the objects that we see on the ground. So this subversion extends to our identities as people, aka race, ethnicity, and social class. This is an installation view of a stranger stance here. Um, this is about the time when I started introducing this idea of diagrams. I thought it was really funny that people would go to my installations and they'd see my work and they'd look at the objects and they, they wouldn't know that they were paper constructions. There's no signage. They're just on the floor. They look like junk. Um, so I started to devise ways to give them more clues, more symbolism. Um, and I also thought it was really cool to think about this idea of a diagram, a way to provide information on what people are looking at, and also to give people the opportunity to fold and unfold something in their own minds, rather than just making a quick one second assumption. Installation view of an enigma and a shadow. This is a piece I call window block. It was actually shot up on 60 something in Roosevelt um, in Seattle. And so on this piece there's things like, it's made of photocopies like all the other work that I just showed you. There's things like car filter, mirror, wood scraps, cardboard, plastic bags. Y'all should just come to my studio. <laughs> and this was just on display at the Bellevue Arts Museum as part of the Bellwether show that um, 
I think was up in September, October-ish. So again, I'm making these diagrams so that the viewer can be an active participant in the show. I think that's really important. My work is very slow and meditative. I kind of require people, or I hope that people will hang out with it for a while and start to question how they notice things and the assumptions that they make about space and objects and, and hopefully in a way that that translates into how they think about other people. So this idea of unfolding and refolding the image in your mind is a really important part of my work. So I'm actually in the process of shipping a bunch of work to a place in Verona, Italy. And the last couple bits before I sign off here are images of some of the work that's going to be part of a group show. This is a, this is a, a replica of construction netting that's all made out of uh, over close to 200 sheets of photocopy paper. It's a, 150 inches long, painstakingly hand cut. <laughs> um, bunch of window blocks, again, photocopies. You saw this piece earlier. White wall. Brown, black, and red. And what I like to do is, when I'm installing a work, I like to get pictures off of the web or have the gallery send them to me. And this is a group show. And they're like, well, we want a wall of your diagrams. Like, well, this is what it's going to look like. So that's, a, that's actually all in crates and get ready to ship out in two days. That brings you up to date, I think. I think. I left 10 minutes for questions. So I, I'm really proud of myself because I really ratcheted through <laughs> an hour's worth of talking about my work in maybe 40, 20, 30, 40 minutes. So um, if there are any questions, now's a good time to ask. Yeah, you know, that's a really good question. Um, I, I, I'm so lucky they're paying me to go out there to install the work. Because the work is so delicate and there's also sculptures as part of that, some of it gets damaged in the process. It's just what happens and I have to remake it. So that's kind of part of the deal. <laughs> yeah. Oh man, that is such a good question. I think I go back and forth. Uh, I think when I look at it holistically, especially if I'm preparing for a presentation like this, I, I do like seeing the connections and I feel, I feel really good about all the, all the ways that those things were weaved together. But the truth is, is that sometimes, I, I have a lot of questions of like, well, why did I do it that way? And, and why couldn't I have um, done this a little bit better or in a different way? And, and even now with my work, I have a lot of questions about it. And I think that's okay. I think, I think this idea of being a perfect artist where you have everything answered is probably the most boring thing ever. Um, I think for me, the pursuit of what will I discover is really important to my work. And it's happening all the time. I get ideas and I explore and some of them they don't work and some of them they do. And it goes back and forth between this sense of feeling very confident and also feeling very vulnerable and struggling with that.
<laughs> that is a good question. Well, like I was pointing to earlier, I, I think I, I used to really try to define that. Um, and I think that to some degree that definition is important um, for establishing what your values are as a person and, and making decisions based on those values. And I think that it's the salt that adds flavor to our lives. However, I also think that it's okay to understand yourself as someone that exists in multiple spaces at one time. And that's really what I'm thinking about now. And when I think about the work that I'm, I'm doing now, especially, especially those sculptures, I'm really thinking about how, like I said earlier, they, they exist as um, something more than themselves. They, they exist first as the assumption that one might make about them, and then they have the potential to become so much more uh, in the future and at the same time. Yeah, so the reason that I chose photocopies is because it felt more related to my own experiences. This idea of growing up, I didn't grow up around perfect mechanically printed photography. And so it felt really disingenuine to me to try to print work on some beautiful archival print that you couldn't touch with your hands. So I, as I was developing this work, I was really fond of the signage that's pasted on boards around town. It's usually printed on photocopies. It's usually wheat, wheat pasted to a board or stapled to a, a telephone pole. And that's what I grew up seeing, and that's what was important to me. And so I wanted to make the work out of that. In answer to your question to it, whether or not it's archival, the <laughs> I don't really I don't really worry about it. I feel like if somebody really wants it to last for a long time, they'll figure out a way to do that. Well, so when I was creating the um, the the twelve, which is the modern day depictions of the apostles. I was deeply uh, researching religion and the painted depictions of the apostles. And it got me really thinking about painting um, and um, as an inspiration for making my work. And I think to some degree, the work that I'm making now is, uh, apologies to all the painters in the room, akin to painting in the way that I display some of these pieces. But beyond that, I don't really think about the connections to Catholicism and religion in my current body of work. Like, I'm not really thinking about um, all those texts and painting depictions other than I saw a lot of paintings during that time and studied painting quite a bit, and I know those collages that I showed you Everybody always says that they, I get a lot of painters who get really excited about them, I guess is what I want to say. Um, but um, but that's, that's about as far as I go with it in connection to, to um, that earlier work. <laughs> well... I do video work, it is true, and I have some video work that accompanies some of this slideshow. However, I wasn't able to show it today. Um, but you could go to my website and click on some videos and write me for a password, and I would be happy to give it to you. Um, unfortunately, the sound wasn't working, and um, I, it, it's, Obviously, it's really important to the work. But yeah, I do video work. I have some video work that is very, very related to this idea of self-seeing and um, the topics of objectification. 
and marginalization. And um, I have a piece that I really wanted to show you today that's um, really connected to uh, the question of what is an object. Any other questions? Oh, and that piece, in case you do want to look it up, is um, it's called An Object Cast a Shadow. You can go to my website and find it. And the password is object. You don't even have to ask. Just go and <laughs> watch it. But, but make, sure you're in a good, in, make sure you're in a chill mood because it's very, very meditative. So one of the things that was happening for me when I was taking those photographs of the apostles on the bus was this question that I had about photography being this, at that time I was making these images that were on these perfect prints that you had to handle with gloves and it was on my computer or behind the camera and it drove me crazy. You know, like I grew up drawing and, and making constructions and I missed that. And I wanted to bring them together and I wanted there to be something tactile um, that I could make and bring to it. And I also know, looking at paintings, how much the artist's index, their finger, their touch is talked about with work. And I wanted to have that aspect, uh, I wanted to have that be an aspect about my work too, to, for you to be able to see the actual artist's hand in the work uh, was something that I wanted to have something that was really important to me. So I honestly don't know the exact trajectory to where I said, okay, I'm gonna start working with photocopies on the floor. Like there was a lot of little things that happened there, but that was what was in my mind when I, before it happened. Like it was there and I, and I struggled with it. I actually do know, I started like taking these photocopies and, and stapling to this board and ripping through them, and that was the very beginning of it. Um, but yeah, that was, I don't know if that answers your question, but that was, that was kind of how I got there. I, I'll, I'll ask, take one more question, then I gotta go. Anybody else, are we good? Okay, thank you all very much.